Good morning, Gateway. It's a beautiful Sunday morning. We're here in the house of the Lord. Let's stand to our feet and worship Him. Through you, I can do anything. I can do all things. Because it's you gives me strength. Nothing is impossible. Strongholds are broken. I am living by faith. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. Oh, oh, oh. Not gonna live. just invite you into this worship this morning we want to give you all our praise we want to give you all the glory
feel my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread from heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up and make me whole. Fill my cup, fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting in my There is only one name by which we can be saved. Amen, Gateway. That's the name of Jesus. Loved before I had a name. Washed before I knew. Oh, the Lamb was slain before the earth was laid. What an awesome price he paid. I owe it all, all to Jesus. Jesus, every part of me, lying at his feet, I owe it all, every breath I take, rise to bring him praise to the glory. Of one day, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Nail pierced hands are holding mine. A crown of thorns has been. My mind, sin cannot exhaust the grace shown on that cross. Mercy brought back what was lost. I owe it all, all to Jesus.
Thank you, Lord. You are the name above all names. You are king above all kings. And through you, we are champions. Through you, we are victorious every time. Amen, Gateway. tried so hard to see it took me so long to believe it that you chose someone like me to carry your victory perfection could never earn it you give what you don't deserve it you take the broken things and raise them to glory. You are my champion. Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you've won. I am who you say. I am seated in the heavenly place undefeated with the one who has conquered it all. Now I can finally see it. You're teaching me how to receive it. So let all the striving cease. Oh. prayers you will be victorious in his name when I lift my voice and shout every wall comes crashing down I have the authority Jesus has given me when I open Every wall comes crashing down. I 
for being in this place and moving only the way you can move. Amen, gateway. What wonderful worship. Hallelujah. Before you all sit down, please greet your neighbors to your left, right, front, and back, and then turn your face to the screen for the announcements. Thank you. Good morning, Gateway. Welcome to church. It's a great day to be here in God's house, and we are so glad that each and every one of you are in church to celebrate God's goodness. If you're a guest with us, we want to extend a special Gateway welcome to you. We feel so privileged that you chose to come and spend your Sunday at Gateway. And our prayer is that you feel so welcomed and encouraged. And if you don't have a home church of your very own, please come and join us again. If you are that guest, we'd love if you do us a favor and fill out what we call a Connect card. Those cards can be found under the seat in front of you or on the table at the back of the auditorium. Simply fill it out and drop it in one of the giving boxes at the end of today's service. And for all of our first-time Gateway guests, we have a special guest gift bag for you. At the end of the service, you can head to the table at the southwest corner of the auditorium where you will find a friendly Gateway volunteer ready to give you a guest gift bag. Just let them know it's your very first time at Gateway today. Also at that table, we have Bibles. So if you're in church and don't have a Bible of your very own, we'd love to make sure you have one in your hands before you leave church today. Gateway, you can keep up to date with everything that's going on here at the church by finding us on social media. You can find us on Facebook and YouTube at Gateway Church Regina and on Instagram at gateway.regina. This is a great way for you to stay up to date with the church and see life at the church posted on our social media. Also, you can go to gatewayonline.ca slash what's happening where you'll see our online church calendar. This shows you everything that's going on at the church throughout the week. Our Wednesday morning book reading connect group is starting a brand new book on Wednesday, September 18th at 10 a.m. The book they'll be reading is called As It Were in the Days of Noah. This book parallels the days of Noah to our current culture. This book reading is facilitated by Adele Neal and we're sure it will be encouraging. So head to the info desk today to sign up if you would like to take part in this book reading group. We are gonna be having another water baptism celebration this fall. You know, God's word says to believe, receive Jesus as your savior, and then follow that up with water baptism. So we believe what the Bible says, so that is what we do. If you are a believer in Jesus, have received him as your savior, are age eight or older, and have not yet been water baptized, then water baptism is for you. You can sign up today at the info desk to indicate that you would like to participate in our next celebration. This celebration date will be coming announced in the weeks to come, but stay tuned for more information on it. It will be this fall. Thank you, Gateway, for partnering with us and giving into the local church. You know, giving is not just generosity, it is obedience to God's word. God's word tells us to bring our tithe into the local church. It is an act of obedience, it's a test of our faith, and when we do so, the Lord will pour out his blessing on us and our families. So there are four ways you can continue to give today. The first way to give is by giving in person. You can drop your giving in one of the giving boxes at the end of today's service. The second way to give is by e-transfer. Transfers can be sent to gateway.donations at gmail.com. The third way to give is by giving online. Head to gatewayonline.ca slash give and follow the prompts. And the fourth way to give is text to give. Simply text the word give to the number that's on the screen right now. That's all I got for you, Gateway. Have a great week. We look forward to seeing you right back here in church next Sunday. Now would be a great time to silence your phones if you have not yet done so. We don't want any distractions during today's message, so please silence your phones now. Now, Pastor Brian, over to you for the last part in our series, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. 
All right, good afternoon, Gateway. Welcome to September. Okay, all right, that sounded like more of a positive response than negative, but usually when September rolls around, we're thinking, oh, no, don't tell me, summer is over, but let's just stretch it out, eh? Let's, let's, let's count on some nice, warm, comfortable temperatures for the next six or seven months. Amen. How's your faith? <laughs> Well, it's great to have you here today. It is Communion Sunday. That's going to be the icing on the cake at the end of the service. We're just so happy that you are able to be in God's house today, and we're going to continue our teaching series on the theme of respect for authority. Hey, we got a whole bunch of students that are heading back to school this week, and there they are going to be respectful of the teacher's authority. That calls for an amen. You know, one of my all-time favorite stories about respect in the classroom is about a, a, a guy who was first just fresh out of teaching college, and, and he's taken on his, his first teaching assignment, and he's in a junior high school. He's got, he's got a classroom full of 13-year-olds, and you know that those 13-year-olds, they, they're going to test the teacher and see how far they can push him. And so first week of classes, there was a real hot day. They had the windows open, try to get some air moved movement in the class. The students are all working or supposed to be working at their desks. And the teacher, he is up front at his desk and he's wearing a shirt and tie. And the, the wind is coming in through the, the window next to him. And his tie is kind of flapping in the wind a little bit. And, and the smart aleck in the class called out and he said, hey, teacher, why don't you take those scissors on your desk and cut that tie off so it's not flapping. Now, what you got to understand is None of the students in that classroom knew it, but during the summer, that new teacher, he wiped out when he was water skiing. He had a little mishap, and he wrenched his upper torso, and so he was wearing a body cast underneath his shirt and tie, but his students did not know that, and when this young smart Alex said, hey, teacher, why don't you, why don't you take that, that pair of scissors and cut your tie off? The teacher stood up, and, and he said, oh, I can do better than that, and instead of the scissors, he picked up his heavy-duty teacher's edition stapler, and he put that stapler on his tie, and he went, bam, 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 <laughs> Woo! and all, every student in the class was wide-eyed, and then they were like this, and <laughs> reportedly, he never had any more challenges to his authority for the rest of that school year, amen, it's a great thing when the teacher can prank the students, huh? Come on, can you handle one more sermon on, on this theme of respect for authority? Let's do that. Before we get into this message today, come on, would you stand with me? And would you boldly repeat after me, I love God, therefore I love the Word of God. The teachings of Jesus are my greatest counsel. My pride and passion is to follow His example. See, the Bible is truth to my spirit joy to my soul, and health to my body. Help me, Lord, to know the book and walk the walk. Amen. Come on, somebody lift up some praise to the Son of God. He is so central to why we're here today. You can be seated. And just a quick welcome to those who are joining us online after the fact, as of 6.30 this evening, welcome to you as well at Gateway. We're all about pointing people to Jesus and celebrating changed lives. And you know, one of the ways that, that we can't help but be changed now that we are calling ourselves Christians, now that we are born again, of course, uh, the Christian life will change us with respect to R-E-S-P-E-C-T, right? So in week one of our series, we talked about respect for God himself, right? That's square one. First, we established that, Lord, we have the utmost respect for you. And out of that relationship of respect flows so much respect for so many other leaders and persons of authority in our lives. And so we've looked at some of them. In week number two, we talked about respect for parents. And then we followed that up in week number three with a message about respect 
respect for employers. And then last Sunday, if you were here, you recall, we, we talked about respect for spiritual leaders. What do you know? Respect for pastors. Pastors are people who should never be like Rodney Dangerfield. You know, I just can't get any respect. No, as pastors, we appreciate when you respect the role that God has called us to fulfill. But that brings us to today's lesson. And so today, let's talk about, about a somewhat sticky subject. And it is this, respect for government leaders or not. Did you know that the Word of God teaches us to respect the powers that be? I can just about hear some of you saying, convince me, Pastor, convince me. Come on, let's read from the writings of the Apostle Paul from the book of Romans, chapter 13, the first seven verses. And here's what Paul says. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Amen. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Verse 3. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from the fear of the one in authority? Then just do what is right and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant to do you, uh, for, for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. And therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. So give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay your taxes. If revenue, then give revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then show honor. He says government is a God-ordained system that is for our good. The problem is... Government doesn't always rule with godliness, and therein lies the rub. You see, whether the people in positions of leadership are Christians or non-Christian, as believers, we know very well that we are supposed to have an attitude of respect for those who are in authority, unless, of course, their policy is in violation of the lordship of Jesus. Then all bets are off. Folks, what I want you to see today from the B-I-B-L-E is the tension between respect for government or resisting government if necessary. And if necessary, we would only do it on scriptural grounds. But there's a tension there between submitting to government or not. You know, for some people, the very mention of government, you just mention the word, you know, politics or politician, and, and, and for, for some people, their, their defense mechanism immediately kicks in and it kind of triggers a, a negative chemical reaction in them. I read about one man who was very politically motivated, very politically opinionated, and, and the story is told that every morning he would, he would stop by a street newsstand on his way to work. And he would pay the young man there that was selling newspapers the money for the paper. And then he would take a quick glance at the front page of the newspaper. And then he would pass it back to that young newspaper salesman. And, and, and that young guy would promptly sell it to somebody else. <laughs> right? It's called double dipping. Mama didn't raise no fools. <laughs> but, but this went on for days, weeks, even months. And finally, this young man stopped the gentleman. And he said, listen... Every day you purchase a newspaper and you take a quick glance at the front page and, and then you hand it back to me and you continue on your way. He said, what's up? Why do you do that? And this gentleman said, well, I'm just looking for a death notice. Young man said, well, in that case, you need to be checking out section three. That's where the obituaries are. And he said, no, son, the death notice that I'm looking for, it'll be all over the front page. <laughs> 
<laughs> you understand, there are some people who have such strong feelings, such deep animosity toward certain governmental leaders. In the book of Proverbs, there are many verses that describe the balance of, of power as some people vote in favor of, of their beloved leader and others will vehemently vote against the, you know, the other candidate. For example, in Proverbs 29, verse 2, it says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. Of course they do. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. Wow, interesting verse. Huh? What wording. Then in Proverbs 29, verse 4, it says, the king establishes the land by justice. Oh, yeah, that's the kind of leadership you want to be under. But he who receives bribes overthrows it. Oh, yeah, the, 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 the government and the, and the country itself is, is subject to collapse when somebody is in charge that operates according to a system of bribery. That's not good. Who wants a leader like that? So a righteous ruler is to be respected. Somebody say amen. amen. But a corrupt king is to be rejected. That also is, uh, is, is, is deserving of an amen. We've got we to gotta figure out what's going on here because there's a tension between respect for authority and, and regard for the government and those who sit in government as opposed to, hey, I can't go along with that. You understand? There's a, there's a tension. Let's get to the bottom of this, folks. The issue that we have on the table today is this. The Word of God clearly instructs us to respect the authority of government. However, everybody say, however. however. Yeah, that's a huge however. It really is. Respect your government. However, when push comes to shove, if, if the government policies and the government legislation is in conflict with what we know to be the will of God, then that's kind of where we have to draw the line and, and say, I don't think so. I don't think I can comply with, with that sort of leadership. You see, when the government takes their, their cut of your salary and, and they start paving the road, or they start giving you some really decent health care benefits or, 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 or some of the other things that governments do that, that make us say, wow, thank you for that. Then in that case, we respect government and leaders, right? But when they say, sorry, you cannot have a march for Jesus in a public place, that's just downright offensive. No way, you're not doing it. See, when they say that, not if they say that, when they say that. Now, it's not yet. Not yet. In fact, we had a march for Jesus just a few weeks ago downtown Regina. In fact, the police were escorting. Yeah, we had a police escort. They were, they were not trying to shut down that march for Jesus. We had an escort. They were helping us to pull off that event. This is a good thing, but you gotta, you got to know that the day will come when it will not be permitted. You will be disallowed to try to have such a public de demonstration of love for Jesus. In fact, there are many countries already where it is against the law to, to do such a thing. Listen, when the Olympic Committee says you cannot have that image of Jesus on your surfboard or you'll be disqualified from the competition, you see, that's the point in time when, when, when you have to say, hey, listen, if you want to counsel me, you can, but I'm not taking Jesus off my surfboard. He goes with me wherever I go. Yeah. See, when the government says you cannot proselytize, not at school, not in the workplace, not in any public place. In other words, you cannot be pushing Jesus. That's when you have to really take a hard look at this concept of resisting the powers that be. You know, there was a young lady, 17 years old. She was voted by her fellow students to be the valedictorian in their graduating class in, in high school. And she's a very popular girl, very outspoken Christian. And the school administration, when they found out that she was the one who had been voted to, to serve as valedictorian at the graduation exercise as well, the, the administration of the school, they claimed that they were following government regulations when they took her aside and, and they gave her some very very strict uh, rules. <laughs> they said, you cannot, and when you give your valedictorian address, you cannot say anything about God. You cannot say anything ab about Jesus. You cannot quote from the Bible. You can't say anything about faith or Christianity. And she said, well, I'll get back to you on that. 
She went home and got before the Lord. She prayed about this, and she realized that she basically had two options. She could go back the next day and say, sorry, I'm not your girl. You'll have to get somebody else to do it. To me, that would be a compromise on my position as a Christian. Everybody knows me, and they would be expecting that from me. Sorry, can't do it. Or that she could actually defy the wishes of the school office and say, you know what, regardless of what they said to me about you know, what I can and can't say, I'm going to say what I want about Jesus. She knew that she had that option as well, but she felt that option A, to just opt out gracefully, would be honoring to the government of the school system, and, and yet it would also be honoring to the Lord. And so that's what she chose to do. And it was the first time ever in the long-standing history of that high school that they had a graduation uh, with no valedictorian because nobody else in the graduating class was willing to step up and be the valedictorian because they all knew that she should be. And so they went without. That's what you call solidarity. Come on. Everybody say solidarity. Acts chapter 4, Peter and John were doing what Peter and John do. They were going around representing the Lord. They were preaching Jesus, and they were administering healing in Jesus' name, all kinds of miracles left, right, and center. And then they got called up on the carpet. Yeah, the authorities read the riot act to them. It's recorded right here in Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 8. It says, Then they called them in again and commanded them to not speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, well, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to listen to God? You be the judge. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. They said, we have seen too much to be muzzled. And they kept right on doing what the Lord called them to do. You see, the whole crux of the matter is, do we submit to God or do we submit to Government. Jesus addressed this issue one day in Mark chapter 12. The teachers of the law, as always, you know, they're, they're always crafting these trick questions, trying to trap Jesus in his words. And they came to him. They said, listen, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, you got to understand, in that day, that was a real hot button issue because here's, here's the Jewish nation and they're under the oppressive Roman government and nobody liked paying taxes to Rome and they certainly didn't like giving their, their money to these publicans who they knew were crooks that were pocketing half of the money and giving the other half to, to the Roman government and nobody liked this system and they, and they come and they say to Jesus, should we give our taxes to Caesar or not? And Jesus said, listen, anybody here got a denarii on you? And so they produced a coin, and Jesus said, whose image is on that coin, and and whose name is in the inscription on that coin? They said, well, Caesar, of course. And so in verse 17, Jesus said, there you go. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and give to God what belongs to God. Amen. Pay your taxes to Caesar and pay your tithes to God and everybody goes home happy. Come on, say amen if you can. I say the Lord help us to achieve a proper balance between obeying God and respecting government. Can you say amen to that? Help us, Lord. We need your help to be able to navigate this course. How many of you have ever felt a certain twinge of disrespect for the government when you heard reports about, you know, the gov- government spending X number of thousands or hundreds of thousands or, or millions, whatever the case may be. They're spending this money on, on research for this or for travel expenses or hotel rooms for government officials or for this scandal or, or financing this other controversial purchase or whatever the, the purchases might have been. But you, have you ever heard these kind of reports that made you think, you've got to be kidding. They spent that kind of taxpayer's money on that? That's incredible, incredibly bad. You know, years ago, James Hutchinson wrote a letter to the editor of the Toronto Globe and Mail, very prestigious national newspaper, and and here's what he wrote. I read with some concern that our government spent some $200,000 on a study of the feasibility of using straw as a building material. I wish to point out that years ago, a thorough study of the subject was already conducted, including a practical demonstration. 
The results of this study were carefully documented and widely published in a book called The Three Little Pigs. <laughs> oh, the devil is a big bad wolf trying to manipulate government officials. All right. So we are called by God to have respect for government, except when doing so would interfere with what we know to be the will of God in a given situation, right? So how do we apply this right where we live? How do we achieve this, this balance in, in this tension between, you know, submitting and, and resisting? There's about a about hundred different ways that we can apply this in our lives. I'm going to try to give you about five of them. Now, I know I told you last week that today we'd be wrapping up this series, but as I got into my preparations this week, I began to realize, hey, I'm going to need another week. And so this morning, I'm going to give you three, and then I'll give you two more points to, to wrap up this, this fifth point next week. So if, that, if I made myself clear with that. But here we go. We're, if you're taking notes, the first one is this. View politics and government from a Christian perspective. Everybody say view. view. Keyword view. We'll come back to it. See, when you embrace the gospel, when you come to realize, man, I need the Lord. I got some friends. It seems like Jesus has made a remarkable difference in their lives. I think I should try this on for size. And when you make that all important decision to say, Jesus, I need you. I need to be spiritually reborn. I need the forgiveness that you offer. I need to get Get, get my act together and become a part of the family of God. And so when we make that decision to become a born-again Christian, wow, there's going to be some, some changes about how we do life, about how we think and how we emote and how we conduct ourselves. And now, as a Bible-believing Christian, now we have a, a new political point of view. Right Before you come to know Jesus, you view, view politics and government through the eyes of a citizen. She's in the natural realm, a citizen. But now, as a believer, you, you, you see government through the eyes of a Christian. Big difference. See, now, now we see this from a spiritual perspective, not just a secular perspective. Now, now we see it from a biblical standpoint, not just from the standpoint of a disgruntled taxpayer. Come on, isn't it true? Before you know Jesus, your sentiment toward go government has to do with things like the economy or your perception of the prime minister as a person. Or you think in terms of, you know, carbon tax or the way they handle or mishandle the pandemic. You see, as a pre-Christian, you form an opinion of government that is based on secular issues, right? But now, now on this side of the cross, now that we've discovered our new and true identity as followers of Jesus, now we see government in a whole new light. As we've been emphasizing throughout this series, we have to be able to differentiate between the person and the position. See, because there may be things about the person himself or herself that you don't really appreciate, or there might be some policies that that person represents or is trying to ram through and, and pass into law. There might be some, some things about their policy that you really do not go along with it, but there is the, the office that the person occupies, and that's where we do have to have an attitude of respect. You know, some of you might remember back in 1981, John Hinckley Jr. shot President Ronald Reagan from close range. It was in a full-on assassination attempt. And so they rushed the president to the hospital. And there in the emergency ward, President Reagan looked up and, and he saw a whole team of medical personnel surrounding his, his bed there, there in the hospital. And they were all wearing masks. And, and President Reagan said, please assure me that you're all Republicans. <laughs> He was a master of quick wit. The fact is that the surgeon that was in charge that day actually happened to be a Democrat. And his response was, he said, Mr. President, today everyone in the country is a Republican. Oh, I like that. That's, that's well said. Listen, whether you, you like the leadership or not, you are to respect the office 
of that person. So when somebody attempts to assassinate the president, it doesn't matter what political stripe you are at that hour. You are all pulling for the president to pull through and make a quick and full recovery. Somebody say amen. amen. It's the office that we have respect for, not necessarily the policies being made by the person who sits in that seat. So earlier in the series, we, we looked at 1 Peter chapter 2. And I'll tell you, what we read in this chapter is bizarre. Now, it's Bible, but it's truly bizarre. Allow me to explain. Verse 13 of 1 Peter chapter 2. And Peter writes and he says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority. So out of respect for the Lord, submit yourself to these various levels of, of leadership and authority in the different departments of life, whether it's parental authority or whether it's at school or in the workplace or at church, in the military. When you bump up against somebody that's in charge, you show respect for, for people. Out of respect for the Lord, we respect these human leaders, he says, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority. Now, humanly speaking, the emperor is the supreme authority. We understand that the Lord is the supreme authority. But Peter says, respect the emperor. Then a couple of verses later, in verse 17, he says it again. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers, so respect for the church. Fear God. That doesn't mean be afraid of God. Remember, that means having the utmost respect for God. And then he says, honor the emperor. Yeah, there it is again. Honor the emperor. This is one of the most difficult statements in the Bible. I'll tell you what, for those first century, uh, the, 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 the believers in, in the early church, for them to try to wrap their minds and their emotions around this injunction given by the apostle Peter, honor the emperor. They're like, what? You've got to be kidding, Peter. No way. See, because you understand, at the time, the man who was the emperor was Nero. Oh, do your homework, man. If you study Nero, you'll find that guy was absolutely ruthless. He was an evil man to the bone. And he had such a hatred for New Testament Christian. One of the biggest persecutors of the church ever. Not just Christian historians, but even secular historians will confirm that Nero would take Christians and he would, he would bind them at the stake and use them as human torches to light up the walkways at nighttime in his gardens. That's, that's about as wicked as it gets. That was Nero. And along comes Peter, and he admonishes the believers of his day to honor the emperor. Man, if you think you have a disliking for, for your prime minister or your president or your king or whoever it is that is in charge in your homeland, Try to imagine how these early church followers of Jesus must have despised Nero. But the word of God to them was, you respect authority as being from God, no matter how, uh, how much of a rascal the man is. Look, I don't know what your emotion is toward, toward government, good, bad, or otherwise, but would you allow the Holy Spirit to produce in you a biblical viewpoint, to, to view politics and politicians from a Christian perspective, from a spiritual perspective, not just a natural perspective? Would you see government through a renewed-minded perspective perspective, not just thinking in terms of, you know, what, what's the government done for me lately? But to think in terms of what can I do about it? Man, if you don't like the way they're running the co country, what can I do about it? Which brings us to point number two, which is, which is this. Pray for those who are elected to public office. Everybody say pray. pray. Come on, this is probably one of the most neglected categories of intercession in the body of Christ. 
There's just a whole lot of people who maybe, you know, maybe give the occasional mention, you know, of, you know, you know, you know, of, of praying for, you know, the leaders of our land. We pray for the prime minister. Maybe there might be the occasional mention, but in terms of, of really getting before the Lord and, and bringing a gang of, of intentional, serious-minded believers together and say, hey, we got to intercede for the leaders of our land. Something is going terribly wrong, and we need to stay stand up against unrighteousness, and we need to pray. Boy, there's a time and place to really get serious about praying and calling on the Lord. This is, this is a responsibility of the body of Christ to, to seriously pray for those in power. 1 Timothy chapter 2 from verse 1, Paul says, I urge then, so this is an urgent Appeals. His, I urge then, first of all, that petitions and prayers and intercession and even thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is this is good and this is really pleasing to God, our Savior. Listen, as Christians, we have a responsibility to pray for our nation. And to pray for those who are in authority. And please don't anybody say, well, well, what difference would, would my prayers make? Little old me, I don't even really know much about how to pray. I'm kind of new in this outfit. Don't ever think, what good will my prayers do? Right? I mean, just, just talk to the snowflake that is a part of the snowman that is on the, the front lawn of, of, of your house in January. And your kids love that snowman. Every snowflake counts. They're all required for the structure of that snowman. Every believer's prayers will make a difference. Just imagine what a, what a tremendous difference it will make when hundreds of thousands of Christians across the nation begin to petition, not just government leaders, but when they begin to, to petition the Lord and say, God, we have got a major issue in our nation that is totally contrary to the word of God. And we're here to stand up against this. And we say, Lord, you have to move. Do something about this. I'll tell you, if God's people don't pray, not a whole lot is going to shift. Not a whole lot is going to be rectified unless and until we pray. Somebody say amen. Yeah. Mm. Government is not just human debate and human decision-making process. It is a spiritual battle in the spiritual realm that is playing out in the political arena. You know, in Ephesians chapter 6, this is, this is one of the passages where the Apostle Paul, who was a real authority on the, on the subject of spiritual warfare, and, and one of the key passages on that subject in your Bible, Ephesians chapter 6, he talks about putting on the whole armor of God, and, and he gives us some tremendous insight here in verse 12. He says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. My goodness, I'll tell you, government leaders are under intense pressure and scrutiny, and like them or not... These men and women need prayer. I tell you, there are tremendous clashes that go on between powers of darkness and the angels of the Lord in the invisible spiritual realm. What's going on in the natural realm as men and women have the good sense to pray will affect change in that spiritual battle in the heavenly. And what goes on in that spiritual battle in the invisible realm will manifest in this physical realm. We've got to understand that. It is so crucial that somebody gets on their faith and begins to pray and then, and then, and then get together with, with a whole band of, of believers that intercede. Wow, there's going to be a stronger emphasis on, on, on prayer in this local church in this fall season. Somebody say, Amen. Proverbs 14, 34. It says, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any 
people. We got to pray that righteousness will prevail in this great nation of Canada, that there will be an uprising of, of more men and women of God than ever before that will, that will get it together and begin to pray and seek the face of God and, 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 and declare the word of God over our country. Come on, everybody say, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. over Canada. Amen. Amen. We got to pray in line with verses like this. Righteousness exalts a nation. We want our nation to prosper. We want our nation to, to be in revival. We want our nation to be healed. And so we pray that righteousness will overrule unrighteousness. That's the way to pray. Pray for Canada. Pray for Canada. Are you familiar with 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14? That's the verse that says, If my people who are called by my name, if they will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Oh, yeah, this land needs some healing. Would you agree with me? But without prayer, that healing doesn't come. The Word of God is clear. If we pray, if we get before the Lord, I'll tell you, it can and will make a difference. If people prayed for governed, government as much as they complain about government, then in due course of time, there'd be nothing about government to complain about, right? Amen. All right, number three, finally, is this. Vote from a Christian perspective. In other words... When it's election time, of course you cast your ballot in favor of the candidate and or the party that best represents our conservative Christian values. I say conservative, small c, conservative. Come on, just, just turn to your neighbor and say, I will not waste my vote. <laughs> Amen. Now listen carefully. People who don't know Jesus may have an entirely different set of election issues that will influence how they vote. You know, they're interested in global warming or carbon tax or inflation or health care or the environment or housing affordability or, or maybe gun control laws, etc., etc. You know, there are some, some secular issues that are very much of interest to, to people who don't know the Lord. So these are the, the issues that they, they want to know from their politicians. Uh, how do you feel about this, that, and the other issue? And these are issues that, that non-believers may have some strong feelings about. And so they vote accordingly. But the issues that are close to our heart, so the issues that we Christians really care about. Now, listen, I'm not saying that any of those, those kinds of issues that I mentioned, just a sampling of them a moment ago, I'm not saying that as Christians, you know, we could care less about those issues. No, I'm not saying that. You might, you might care very much about some of those issues. But certainly as believers, there are specific issues that are real close to our heart because they're real close to the Lord's heart. How about this one? Protecting the lives of the unborn. Oh, my goodness. Now, there's an issue that you and I should care very deeply about. Like, Mr. Candidate, where do you stand on this one? Or how about the opioid crisis? Like, Mr. Prime Minister, please stop pushing and dealing drugs in our nation. Amen. Yeah, amen is right. How about freedom of speech? Now you're talking. Oh, yeah, as Christians, we got a horse in that race. Freedom of speech, that's, that's going to be increasingly an important issue for us going forward. Or here's an issue that ranks right up there. Support for Israel. Yeah, we know very well, according to the word of God, if we bless Israel, then God will bless our nation. Genesis chapter 12, there, verse 3, it couldn't be any clearer. Bless Israel. And you will be blessed. In, in case you're new to Christianity, you just need to understand that, that the, the church is supposed to be a, a strong supporter of the nation of Israel. God bless Stephen Harper. There was a prime minister that was a true friend of Israel and still is. What about the gender debate? Oh, that's definitely of interest to us as, as children of God. You see, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33, it says, God is not the author of confusion. 
Yeah, he, he, he's not the originator, the designer, the creator of confusion. No, he's the author of humanity. The Bible says that he made them male and female. There is no confusion or controversy necessary. If we would just take the word of God at face value. Now, there are people who are confused about their gender. Yes, for sure. And we don't love them any less. I said we don't love them any less. We are not criticizing people who are in the that situation in their life. But the fact is, the truth is, the truth is that God created them male and female. DNA does not lie regardless of what we think about it, regardless of what we feel in our emotions about it, regardless of what our opinion on the subject is, regardless of how we choose to believe concerning the the gender debate. The truth is the truth is the truth. The truth is the inalterable truth, and that is that he made them male and female, period. Genesis 1, 27. Now, I tell you, that is an issue that is very important to us. Don't tamper with creation. If anything, defend creation. Folks, can I put it like this? As followers of Jesus, we are not so much interested in climate change as we are interested very much so in spiritual climate change. Oh, we want to see righteousness prevail over unrighteousness in our nation. We want to see genuine revival. We want to see an uprising of men and women of God who will take a stand on on some really crucial issues in our generation. We want to see spiritual climate change. Try that one on for size and see how it fits. And vote for the candidate that that comes closest to, to speaking up for your Christian. Christian values and beliefs. And not only that, but if there are Christians who are candidates, I say help them get elected because the Lord needs more Bible-believing men and women of God to, to run for public office so that they can be salt and light in the seat of government. That deserves an amen. You know, there was one pastor... One Sunday morning, they were just days away from a national election, and, and, and the pastor addressed the congregation in the pulpit one day. He, he said, now, ladies and gentlemen, you know that by law, I am not allowed to tell you how to vote, but I do want to remind you that this Thursday is re-election day. Some of you didn't get that, but later on, it'll come to you. The point is, It all comes down to this. All that we are and all that we believe as Christians is based on biblical truth. Come on, how many of you know that the Bible is a veritable catalog of absolute truth? You know, if you say amen, you will not scare me. The Bible is truth. See, as as Christians, the the truth that we love, the truth that we contend for, it's all in the book. We are the people of the book. Proverbs 23, verse 23 says, buy the truth and sell it not. Don't don't ever have a yard sale and, and sell the truth. Don't do that. Now, you get a hold of the truth of God's word and you hold on for dear life. Now you grasp the truth of Scripture, and no man or devil can wrestle it away from you. Buy the truth, and don't ever unload it. Word of God is absolute truth. So what is of interest to us is God's truth. All in favor, say aye. But the problem is, The government is a ruling body that makes legislation and laws of the land that is based on secular information, not based on Bible truth, but based on secular information, which often flies in the face of biblical truth. Am I right? You know that that's true. So listen carefully. When you vote, you know, voting to elect a government officer, You're not voting for a certain candidate or a certain political party, although that's what will be named on the ballot. But you are really voting for truth. 
You are voting for what we Christians stand for. You are voting for Jesus, right? WWJV, who would Jesus vote for? I say, Holy Spirit, help us to view government, not through the eyes of a citizen, not sizing up government, how, they, how well they do or how awful they do from a natural standpoint. No, no. So help us, Lord, from here on out. We're not looking at politicians. We're not looking at government. We're not looking at, at policies as a citizen, but as a Christian. Amen. Much different. Holy Spirit, give us insight. Holy Spirit, give us revelation. Give us a truly biblical perspective on life and on those who are in charge in this current earthly dimension. So help us, Lord, to be wise. Viewing government, perceiving government, not as a citizen, but as a Christian. Come on, would you stand with me? Well, as I said, I was only going to cover three points today. Next week, we're going to finish off with the other two points in point number five, session number five. So t next week, we're, we're going to get into some of the nitty-gritty of of where this is all leading to. Because somebody says, well, Pastor Brian, are, are we heading for a one world government? Absolutely, 100%, for sure. The Bible says so. It's Bible prophecy. You know that's coming down the track. Someone says, well, then, are we still supposed to respect and cooperate with government as things move in that direction? That's what we're going to talk about next Sunday afternoon. I hope you can be here. Because we are the people of the truth. We're not letting go of the truth. We're not compromising on the truth. We're not selling the truth. Well, I mean, we're selling the truth to anybody that's willing to listen to us in that sense. Yeah, we're selling the truth. Man, we're spreading the truth all over town. But my friends, buy the truth. And don't ever give it away. <laughs> well, do give it away. <laughs> Oh, I can't find the right wording for it, but you know what I mean. We hold fast to God's truth, and we conduct ourselves toward members of government accordingly. We pray for them. Amen. We petition them. We let them know where we stand. We make our views abundantly clear. I tell you, the church in our generation needs to have a strong, authoritative voice. Also a very loving, respectful voice. Amen. Amen. So help us, Jesus. We are people who have a healthy, biblical perspective on those in government. Remember, there's a lot of good to be said for government. But there's a lot of things to be said for government. Ooh, needs to be changed, needs to be revamped, needs to be cast down in Jesus' name. We have a vital role as men and women of God in this season. You watch for more announcements. We, we're we're, we're going to push forward with a stronger emphasis on, on prayer and fasting and seriously seeking the face of God in this fall season. I hope, I hope you are inviting of that. I hope you look forward to that. I hope you'll get into that and participate. Come on, let's rise up. Let's rise up and let's discover our responsibility and our role as men and women of God in 2024. Can you say amen? Come on, my friends, it's communion time. It's communion time. Communion is for believers, for those who know Jesus as their Savior. So before we celebrate these emblems and what they represent for us, let's pray the prayer of salvation. Come on, let's get ourselves into an attitude of prayerfulness right now because it may very well be that there's individuals here in church today or maybe those who are watching online. If you've never truly committed your life to Christ, but you just know, Pastor, I need to do that today. Whether you are receiving Jesus first time or whether you just know, I need to rededicate myself to the Lord right here and right now. With every head bowed and every eye closed, in this personal moment of commitment, 
If you know that you need to say, Jesus, please come into my life. Lord, please forgive me. I, I need to get back on track with you. If that's you, my friend, just, just raise your hand wherever you are across the room until I can acknowledge it. Yes, I see your hand at the back. Thank you. Are there others? Yes, I see your hands up front. Good for you. Who else? This is your day to say, Lord, count me in. Yes, I see your hand over on my left. Thank you. You can put it down. Anybody else? Just wave at me. Be bold. Don't be held back by any sort of self-consciousness. Come on now. It's the proudest moment of our life when we say, Jesus, I need you, and I'm so ready to run with you. Anybody else? Just wave at me wherever you are across the room before we all pray this prayer together. Amen. Amen. Come on, church. Let's do this together with, with a boldness of faith and with, and with a loyalty for Jesus. Some of you have, have known the Lord for many years, but it's still good to just freshly reaffirm your loyalty to Jesus Christ. So come on, let's all, let's all pray this prayer together. Would you, would you join me? Would you follow after me? Let's pray this. Heavenly Father, of course I receive your gift of salvation. I receive your son to be the savior of my soul. Jesus, I believe you died on that cross to take the blame for all of my sin. I'm asking you today to forgive me. Cleanse me with your precious blood. Jesus, I know you rose from the dead to give me a brand new start in life. And so I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit. Help me to live as a Christian. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. That's okay. Don't even worry about trying to clap right now. I know you got your communion kits in hand. Hallelujah. I better grab mine. Oh, yeah. Communion, communion. Of course, these emblems symbolically remind us of what Jesus accomplished for us with his death and resurrection with his body and his blood. That little wafer reminds us of how they nailed Jesus' body to the cross and along with him, all of our sins, everything about us that was offensive to heaven, it was all tacked on Jesus so that we would no longer have to bear the blame. Sweet forgiveness. Come on, everybody, make, make this profession of faith before we receive the wafer in respectful remembrance of the Lamb of God who laid his life down for every one of us. Come on, everybody, make this declaration with me. Say this. By his stripes, I am totally healed, spirit, soul, and body. I receive it now. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's receive that wafer. Mm. Something very powerful about acknowledging the death of the Son of God. Bearing the judgment of God so that we would no longer be subject to God's wrath. Not now, not ever. Praise God. Oh, let praise to the Lord just rise up on the inside of you, a deep sense of eternal gratitude. When you think about this little cup of, of grape juice, it reminds us of the blood of Jesus Christ. Everybody say, I am redeemed. I am, redeemed. I am totally forgiven. I am, totally I am, made, new. I am made new. I'm a child of God. And I hold fast to the truth of the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, folks. Let's receive the cup. Mm. Oh, thank you, Lord. That is so good. So good. Isn't it good to be a part of the family of God? Thank you so much for being a part of our worship experience here in church today. I want you to know we're going to dismiss in just a moment with a word of blessing. But when that's finished... I want you to know this altar is still open. Our prayer partners will be only too happy to pray with you if you would like some one-on-one -on -one personal prayer. Just make your way up to the altar and they'll be 
Real glad to pray with you. If you raised your hand to receive Jesus a few moments ago, wow, good for you. Congratulations. Come on, everybody, give a hand to those who raised their hand to receive Christ or to rededicate yourself. That is just the smartest decision we ever make in life. And I just want to encourage you, if that's you, make your way to the the table back at the southwest corner of the auditorium. We've got some great literature that we would like to put in your hand because we're all about doing everything we can to encourage you to be strong in your relationship with the Lord. Well, folks, thank you again for being here today. And now, may the blessing of God rest upon Every household represented here today, as you go on your way from church, the Holy Spirit go before you and prepare the way and set up some some great experiences for you as you reach out to people this week. Be on the lookout for folks that you can just extend encouragement to them in Jesus' name. Be compelled by the love of Christ. Amen. And be always governed by the truth of God's Word. Can you say amen? Amen. God bless you, Gateway. We'll be officially dismissed, and the altar is open. Thank you for joining our online service today. We pray that you were so encouraged by the worship and the message. And hey, if you've been blessed by the worship and the messages here at Gateway, we'd love if you partner with us. You can head to gatewayonline.ca slash give to do so. And if you're in the Regina area, we would love to have you join us in person for one of our services very soon. There's a chair here waiting for you. But if you're not able to make it in person in Regina, we'll see you right back here next Sunday for another Church Online.